All right, welcome to the final session. This, of course, is the big surprise session because we will learn what you have been doing over the two and a half days in your cluster meetings. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to, to the outcomes of those conversations. Before, however, we start with that, I wanted to give a brief opportunity to Matthew to talk a little bit about the event that is going on tonight at the Meta Lab, to which all of you are invited. Hi there, everybody. Uh, I'm sitting down because, uh, because we've got microphones here. Um, uh, um, I'm Matthew Battles with Meta Lab, which is, uh, which is the Berkman Center's project in, in uh, technology in the arts and humanities. And uh, I, I want to echo Urs' call to uh, welcome all of you to join us uh, at our uh, weekly uh, workshop hack session for uh, two integrated uh, uh, seminars that we that we teach in uh, Harvard College and uh, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences in the digital humanities. Uh, students are undertaking projects in a variety of different kinds of media, uh, data visualization and analysis uh, projects across history, uh, comp lit, and the arts, uh, media uh, uh, projects as well. And uh, it's a very open format. Uh, they often have visitors drop in, and Dennis Tenen, uh, the uh, postdoctoral fellow who teaches in those seminars, uh, runs the scene there. And, and I think it's a, it's a, a, a wonderful experience uh, to take part in. As well, I'll, I'll um, for those interested, demo Zika, an open source uh, uh, application that was initially developed by MetaLab uh, to, which is a, essentially a kind of WordPress for multimedia documentary, uh, an, an open source application for developing documentaries out of uh, online resources. Uh, I'll show anybody who's interested how that tool works and we can talk about applications to your own work or, or, uh, or other projects as well. Uh, that's tonight at 29 Garden, which is up by the Longy School of Music, past the Cambridge Common, a nice walk. Thank you so much. I can really highly recommend it. Uh, MetaLab is doing fantastic work and uh, make use of this opportunity if you're still around and don't have to leave immediately after the conference. Second announcement relating, uh, related to tomorrow's Hack Day. SJ, you want to say a few words? Or Erhard? <laughs> or Erhard. Uh, sorry. All right. Hi, uh, Erhard Great. Um, I've spoken to a lot of you uh, over, the over the last couple of days, um, hoping that you will come up with ideas for the hack day tomorrow. So we're running this from 9 to 4 p.m. Um, and you can find details on the wiki about that. Um, but starting with this session, we're really going to be grabbing these ideas and hoping to distill them into things um, that we can hack on tomorrow as groups. And we're, when we say hack, we don't mean necessarily that we're going to be producing you know, code or full-scale projects tomorrow, but we're going to be fleshing some of these ideas out and setting them down a path that we could actually produce something you know, uh, tangible or, or with impact based on these ideas that, that we've identified, these solutions to, to, to the problems that are, that are affecting the OER movement. So I encourage everyone to, to um, you know, come to me, or come to SJ, um, and some of the other folks that are gonna be involved in the Hack Day, and even if you're not gonna be there, just pitch us hard on those ideas that you think we need to be working on, uh, because we're gonna take that seriously and get the ball rolling in, in a quick way tomorrow, so thanks. Thank you so much also for really organizing the hack day. It's uh, greatly appreciated and you guys, you just rock. Thank you so much. Um, with that, it's time to turn over to Rob uh, for, for uh, the presentation of the heat map revisited. What has changed since we looked at it uh, last time? So obviously that these are now more specific suggestions um, and interventions that you proposed in the cluster meetings. Uh, this should be interesting and fun. Uh, I've already had a preview and uh, I'm pleasantly surprised. Uh, it's great. It's been an experiment. We have never done these cluster uh, meetings uh, before uh, and so I'm looking forward to that presentation. Uh, we will actually, I will uh, have a hard stop at five because I'm teaching. So um, with that, I just would like to thank you again for being here. It's been a fantastic uh, two and a half days. I've learned a lot. Uh, it's a very impressive group, and I really appreciate uh, all your contributions, and I'm looking forward to future interactions. Please come back uh, to Cambridge and visit us at the Berkman Center, um, and thanks for, for collaborating with us. With that, Rob, the floor is thank yours. You, thank, thank you. Yours. Is this working? Great. Uh, so what we do want to start with is hearing from the breakout groups that we just had, so I'm hoping that 
uh, three or more of you are prepared to give us a few insights, some nuggets out of the past hour's discussion. So I know Juan Carlos, you're one of them, is that right? Can I start with you while the others prepare themselves? Fine, sure. Thank you. I was um, moderating stream one, high quality supply. And uh, so this is going to be just my personal takeaway takeaway points, see the transcript for a much more complete report. Great. So what I was impressed particularly are, first of all, a conceptual point about quality. Um, we heard that uh, quality is not the property of the resource itself, like an absolute quality. It's always uh, the resource and the <coughs> audience, the people that are supposed to use the resource. Uh, so mm, we can have a very accurate uh, resource, but it's not in the right language or is not at the right level of education. So it's not possible to speak of quality in absolute terms. It's always quality for a specific objective, a specific audience. So this is, a, in a sense, it, it just underlines the difference between OER and uh, free software, open source software. Um, it, it, in the case of software, uh, forking, uh, sometimes it's a good thing, but it can be a sort of a nuclear uh, option. I'm moving away from the trunk in the case of OERs, forking is absolutely part of the process. We have to fork it for different audiences. Uh, so this conceptual point was then seen in specific settings uh, because we heard about South Africa and so the need to have resources in, for instance, in African languages. We heard that basic literacy uh, resources are very uh, few and not of a high quality. Uh, we heard about the fact that uh, there are local, for instance, medical problems. You want to develop resources about medical issues. And if you want to do it for South Africa, you have medical needs that are not the same as in Boston, for instance. Uh, then we heard again the concept of uh, quality, meaning doing something for a specific audience in the case of virtual university of small states, 32 states across the world. And in that context, we heard also the role of frameworks uh, for formal quality requirements. And then we heard about the open high school in Utah. And in that case, also two additional points, which is uh, uh, the quality achieved by su supporting the teachers in finding quality resources. And uh, the quality of the resources assessed by assessing the students who use them. So implicitly, you are assessing the resources itself. And finally, uh, a more general observation, not specifically related to quality that I want to share with you because I, I really liked it, uh, that open education resources are an infrastructure itself. And perhaps the emphasis that we have right now on open education resources is not entirely uh, tuned properly, meaning that we're focusing so much on the resources and while maybe we should be focusing on what more, on what we could, could do with the resources. The analogy was nobody gets that excited apart from electrical engineers like me with electricity or with water or with roads, their infrastructure. We are more excited what we can do with electricity or water or roads and maybe the same should apply for open education resources. Also talking to the outside world, stressing the amazing things we can do with this fundamental infrastructure. Excellent, thank you so much. Does anybody from the uh, Quality, uh, quality of, of supply group want to add on to that? Is there anything else that we should throw into the mix? It sounded like a great summary to me. There's a lot of richness in there. So uh, quality in use, quality in context, as, as well as many other things. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos. Uh, who would like to give us a short rundown of the other two uh, sessions? Who's, uh, I, I apologize on Peter, are you one of them? Excellent, thank you. Uh, our group was devoted to supportive policies there were six of us, all of us had policy experience, so we didn't have to persuade each other that adopting policies is difficult. Uh, but we did spend quite a bit of our time on the nuts and bolts of policy efficacy and why it's difficult, how to overcome some of those difficulties, how to anticipate some of those difficulties, uh, starting with the acknowledgement that OER uh, are not widely understood and that the licensing terms are not widely understood. And some of the basics that you would want to put into a good policy won't be understood by policymakers you'd like to adopt the policy. So there's a hard persuasion problem at the threshold. There's a hard education problem at the threshold. So you could say we, we talked about nuts and bolts, or you could say we commiserated about those difficulties, but we all recognized that they were uh, worth overcoming. 
I think we all also acknowledge that achieving policies is not sufficient. Uh, there are certain barriers to OER that can only be overcome if we adopt certain policies. So in that sense, policies are necessary. But uh, as one of our panelists put it, policy change is not the goal. Uh, changing practice is the goal. Uh, or another way, uh, I sometimes put it, you want uh, motivated uh, participants and stakeholders, uh, teachers, students, uh, administrators, legislators, parents, uh, not just a policy which makes this possible or which uh, facilitates it. So even if policies are necessary, you've got to get uh, beyond policies to the other factors that would bring about the change that you actually want. And we talked about some of those. Uh, we talked about how policy intersects with some things that are hard to dictate through policy, such as quality. You can't dictate policy <coughs> or quality through policy. Uh, on the other hand, insofar as quality is measurable, you can use quality metrics within the policy. On the other hand, maybe quality is not measurable. Uh, at least uh, impact is measurable. And there are surrogates that are better and worse. We didn't talk a lot about those, but we did recognize the difficulty of the problem. Uh, I think we recognize that different policy makers and different institutions might have to adopt different kinds of policies. That it's a policy for a school, uh, might have to differ from a policy for a school district, which might have to differ from a policy for a state or a nation. Uh, a policy for university might have to differ from a K through 12 institution. So as you're thinking about what policies would facilitate OER, think about uh, what jurisdiction you're talking about, what kind of policy maker you're talking about, what kind of target institution you're talking about. And uh, think about what policies would be desirable for that jurisdiction or for that uh, institution. And we close with a good discussion on whether the problem is large or small. That's one way to put it. Uh, should we simply try to achieve an OER version of some curricular materials that are not currently free today? Or should we use this opportunity, uh, this historical moment in which we're changing uh, toward openness on many policy fronts <coughs> at once, to achieve a deeper kind of change that goes beyond simply changing some resources from unfree to free? Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Does anybody want to add to that? So I, I'm going to ask a question in the interim as well, which is, uh, Certainly there's, what we've seen from the last couple of days is, is a lot of different ideas pushing on a lot of different things and policy being one of the important ones. And a, a question for this, all these separate interventions is how to sequence them and how to kind of allocate time and attention to the various things. And there's two different versions of these, perhaps not completely mutually separable, but one is to change the world and, and let policy follow along in, in the aftermath as kind of an afterthought. The other is to <laughs> devote everything towards policy and say we need to change the hearts and minds of the, of the top-down decision makers and that's the only way it's gonna happen or something in between. Did you pick up on that at all in your discussions or do you have a thought on that? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, I talked about it in my little presentation. I put the point this way. Uh, after you've got some policy adoptions, you've got some targets for research, for data gathering, for case studies, and all of those should be thoroughly discussed, in part because the policies that are already adopted may not be uh, as good as they could be, so you need right. people to point out the weaknesses, and if they are good, you want people to spread the word. But once you've got this buzz going, then it turns around and helps uh, adopt more policies. So I like to think of it as a feedback loop, not as a sequential chicken and egg problem. If you think of it as a chicken and egg problem, then you're paralyzed and you never get to step one. Uh, do you change the world first uh, and then adopt policies because the world has made that possible, or do you uh, change policies to help change the world. If you think of it that way, then you do get stuck. But if you work on all fronts at once, then you can let policy change create the buzz, which creates further policy change. Uh, and then you can, if you're not in a position to pull the levers of power, you can simply work on the buzz, which helps to adopt policies. Great, thanks so much. Please, please. Yeah, I was also in that group, and I just want to add that I think we were also just beginning at the end to have a conversation saying we, we see how policy has been used and very effectively in a lot of ways now around changing some of the textbook policies and whatnot. But that was there a way, like we were, can we, can we be brainstorming and grappling with this idea of not changing the world, but what kinds of policies could we be doing that more directly impact the teaching and learning 
aspect of what we're doing. In our, and and we, 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 some of us weren't content to say it's just an institutional issue about yeah. changing culture. So, so how, how do we maybe key in on some of those more cultural changes in a targeted way that actually would be a national policy, uh, something as easy to comprehend as a textbook? Uh -huh. That's very useful. Thank you. Please. So about, about, uh, about six or seven years ago, Kathy and I were uh, in Northern Africa uh, at, a, at a major meeting. And one of the things that we ended up doing was um, trying to forestall many of the Europeans from, from instituting a variety of policies about open education resources. It's almost uh, a, a sense of, uh, you know, they, they, they saw it coming, they wanted, and they wanted to control it. They wanted, they wanted something to control, a policy to control it. And it's almost the direct opposite of, of uh, open education resources is to create all sorts of rules for creating them and so on. How would they be judged? And can we use things that aren't, you know, aren't of the highest quality and so on and so on. Throwing out the whole idea that, that this is also a, a, a mix uh, created by people who aren't necessarily going to create the highest quality content, but they're going to learn from it and so on. So, so I, and, and I've, in my life, I've had a, a lot of experience with policy in Washington uh, in five administrations. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm scared to death of the policy that, that could surround this thing. Uh, we can't control the legislature. We can't control the Supreme Court, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the more we push, let's have a lot of policy uh, in order to help us along, the more we run the risk of, of, uh, of having a real calamity on our hands. So, so I, I think we just have to be very careful. This is a very thin line to walk. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think we should think campaign rather than policy. That is changing hearts and minds and getting things done as you do it different kind of strategy, uh, and it's a mobilization strategy, bringing lots of people together around you, and letting, letting that then drive what might be a natural policy at the state level, let's say, for, for uh, textbooks. The reason that there are open textbooks now, folks, is because it was a campaign launched by the students. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all that we did was nothing compared to what they did. So, so I just think we have to Great. be careful. About this. Thank you. So, uh, policy is a double-edged double sword. It was kind of the nature of my question to, to Peter is when do we choose to focus on a given lever and when might it be more prudent to avoid the whole policy, policy context? There was another question that came out of this that I don't know if anyone has taken on or, or would take on, but it's, it's the role of, of state government action and investment in this. And I, uh, I, I walk here gingerly knowing nothing about this topic, and, and so I, I don't know if the debates have been raging in this area for, for many, many years or have been resolved many years ago, but I, I just wanted to pause on that as, as, as a question mark as well. And, and in doing so, I was wondering if I might call on the, uh, the people who put together one of the interventions, which I will mangle if I don't read it, but it's the Common Core state standards. Does somebody from that, that team want to give a, a quick little couple sound bites as to what they were proposing in that one? I'm kind of cold calling people there. Yes, yeah. Do we, do we, do we not want that out there? In the, yeah. <laughs> can, can you find a, can you find a, a microphone? So this was one of the very few interventions that was put out there that said, here, the state needs to do something, and here's how we want them to do it. And that's why I was curious about that one. Well, I guess you know, it was obviously a, a, a bent there because of that particular cluster as we had a little bit of um, loss of heads over time. What ended up getting left behind was me as state ed tech director and my peer who is the executive director of the State Ed Tech Directors Association. So between the two of us, working together closely, me, the, the chair of the board of the organization, and him, the, my executive director, um, we have a political or a particular bent on trying to do things from a state perspective. And I think we very firmly believe that a lot of things from a policy perspective need to be driven at the state level. The federal government obviously is not in a position, nor do they want to be pretty clearly, kind of pushing states around. There's always kind of been that state and federal relationship They'll try and kind of set some guidance, some ideas. They may push some money around. But at the end of the day, the state's always trying to assert their statehood. I'm a state. Don't tell me what to do. 
right? Which is the same relationship we have at the state level with our schools to some degree. Um, but if we really want to see mass movement of things, we know that there are certain times when the states do need to step in with their local districts and say, okay, look, we're going to assert some leadership here because you always get this from the, the local level, the schools. They say, don't tell me what to do. Like in Maine, it's fiercely local control, right? We are the, the descendants of Massachusetts. We used to be part of Massachusetts, right? Plymouth Rock, pilgrims came here. They said, King, get out of my house. We're going to do what we want to do. So that still lives strong in a lot of states. But instead, at the same time, they always say, don't tell me what to do, but how did you want me to get it done, <laughs> right? And so what we were looking at with this was the idea that with the Common Core, the great promise was this idea that if, if many, many states, and we've got now, what, 46 or so, can agree on state standards, then it kind of necessarily drives you toward this idea that, oh, well, then now the content that supports that work can be common. And the, old, the whole idea behind that was that we could start to share, because one of the, the, the traction point, the, the struggles we've always had in states with, with different state standards, you had textbook companies and producers producing specific editions in particular for you know Texas, Florida, California, the big places. And the rest of us just kind of, they would find an alignment guide that would kind of say, oh yeah, yeah, here's yours, and this, this aligns to you too. But there was some individualization and there was a lot of just kind of inefficiency in that system. And so now that we have all these states who are thinking, okay, now we have all this, this common standards and everyone is clamoring now in the states and at the local level going, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, what happened? do I have to change what I do now? And the answer we, try and say to them, yes, you do. And then they say, well, how are we going to do it? And what we were suggesting then is states come forward and say, okay, so let's do this. And, and I'm not sure why it hasn't happened more. We've, many of us have been saying, you know, how come we're not doing this yet? It's to simply say, okay, we need uh, third grade ELA content to, to help kids meet these standards that we all agreed are the third grade ELA content standards. I need some volunteers. How about three states? Who wants to do it? One, two, three, great, okay, now I need fourth grade. Ooh, okay, one, two, three, you know, pick out three, four states. And if those states then organize their teachers to do a little bit, you know, it's that simple camp mentality, summer camp. If everyone does a little, nobody does a lot. Right now what we're seeing is lots of states trying to do this, and they all talk about sharing. Oh, when we're done, anyone can use it. Because, you know, we, we, they all seem to agree on this openness of the Common Core, but they're still doing it inside their state boundaries which then is wasteful because no one's even coordinated the fact that if Hawaii is working on three, third grade ELA, they don't actually know whether or not Wyoming is doing the exact same thing, which they very well may be doing. And so I think the goal here was to say, okay, look, from, a, from the state ed tech director's positions across all the states, we could say, look, we need to coordinate this effort a little better and say, okay, so who is working on third grade? Let's not duplicate efforts. If two states have invested in this idea that they want to do third grade ELA, let's get them together and they can mince up the work a little bit and say, okay, you guys focus on these pieces, you focus on these pieces, and we'll have meetings every month. And then beyond that, there was this idea that from the open standpoint, a lot of what we've discussed as a group about this, uh, the, the iterative nature of open content and the value of the iterative nature, being able to keep modifying and making it better over time, that we also then needed to change, and this would be a long-term process, changing the model that would the teachers have with their relationship to their content. Instead of this notion that, well, my curriculum coordinator told me that we got new books this year. It's a good thing, because I haven't seen a new book since I was, you know, in, in the 60s. But now I got a new book. This is great. Here it is. OK, this is what I use, which is what happens today in many schools. Instead, it would be, look, every summer, we get teachers together. It's ongoing professional development. And working with those teachers to re-examine that content. What hasn't worked for you throughout the year? And, and hopefully maybe even do it more often, but you're probably gonna have to have some certain points in time where you actually gather people together and say, okay, what didn't work about this curriculum this year? What should we fix? It's all open so we can either rewrite ourselves or maybe someone found something during the year that they just grabbed and inserted and said, you know, this worked a whole lot better than what was in the, the theoretical kind of canonical version of what we created as great, a consortium. Great. So we're gonna be seeding the, uh, the creation of more um, OER resources using state oomph and, and coordinating capacity. Is that, that all sounds pretty good. Is there a downside to this? Does that make anybody nervous or, or is this all working in the same direction and the same good? I just want to say, I w I'm not going to say a downside. I just want to actually link that to the, the, the conversation about policy because we need yeah. to look at that and say, you know, there were some policy decisions made uh, about uh, federal grant money 
that required states to work with Common Core if they wanted to partake in those monies. Yep. And so we have a great example of sort of some policy levers and then actual more you know work that's done in a distributed way. I also just didn't know we have Jennifer from Achieve here if she wanted to add anything about those standards because they're certainly the kind of the national experts in what's going on there. Yeah. Let's hear it, Jennifer. No, I, I wouldn't play that. Actually, <laughs> uh, the Common Core was coordinated by the Council of Chief State School Officers, the National Governors Association. So I would rather turn it over to Linda. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of like a re-cold calling, is what this is. <laughs> yeah. Linda, <laughs> is your is your, is your microphone working, Linda? Thanks. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Linda. Uh, let's move on to our next pillar, if we can. Who's our Who's our third pillar representative? That would be uh, the standards group. Is that right? Yeah. Was there a rapporteur for that? At the airport. At the airport. So are we uh, Are we in the dark then? Does any Can anyone give us a couple of tweet length observations out of that, or or okay. as long as you want to go, please. <laughs> Um, so I was in the standards uh, section, it was, it was very interesting and hooks up with what we've just been talking about, the Common Core area, yep. because we uh, talked about the use of the Achieve rub rubric, and um, so that gave a way in which you could make some judgments. I think it's an interesting overlap with the quality discussion, because in a way there's no absolute quality, you can say, for resources, unless you know the context of being used in. So the Achieve rubric was being used and put into the OER commons environment as a way to, to actually say, well, if the context is common core, then here's a way in which you might describe the way in which it works. I think that's, that's is that fair as an interpretation? Okay. Uh, but I think the other really interesting blending in this standards area was uh, the discussion about um, work on how resources can be adjusted um, or replaced to match the needs of particular people in the margins, uh, mm -hmm. people with uh, accessibility problems, uh, people with any sort of issues really about how they might use content, and that can be it, absolutely you know, all of us. Um, and so there the, the, the flow system was described in particular, work here at Harvard, uh, CAST was described on universal learning design, and um, so that is a place where the power of the, the sort of working with open resources comes through. Because open resources are changeable resources. So you might in the past have been stuck with a resource that uh, you know isn't suitable for everybody and you'd like to make changes. But where's the permission to do that? Open resources have that permission. And I think the work of those two groups on working out what you would then do to make the match Right. It's, it's really a good one. So there's sort of two sides of it, sort of looking at how standards about what you learn might help us judge um, what performance of particular resources and also appreciating what 
the range of diversity of needs are, will make us realize that changeable resources are really valuable resources in this circumstance. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you so much. Anything else to pile on to that? Should we move on? I should probably um, pivot at this point to <coughs> discuss the results of your, of your clusters. Uh, it'll really be part of this, the same exercise. So uh, when we envisioned this process, we thought about 90% or so of it, um, the, of this measure of success in this would be getting people together to have substantive, interesting conversations. So I want to declare victory on that and give ourselves an A right off the bat. So I'll do that. And then um, if there's anything else we get out of that, I'd be very happy. So the next part of it was the notion of having a substantive conversation about interventions into a space. So taking general ideas and problem statements and crafting them into concrete, uh, actionable changes in the world, mentioning who's gonna do what, what the impact would be, how much it would, be, how, how much it would cost. And uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that if you take um, highly motivated, skilled, intelligent people with a lot of experience in this space and put them around tables for a day that they're gonna come up with really good ideas. So um, I, gu I guess that's one takeaway from those. There's, um, I don't know, maybe 18 or 20 interventions listed in there. And uh, they're there for you to browse and look at and they're, they're very, very interesting. Um, and, and some of them I think are, are uh, really seeds for, for further interventions in the space and could be, uh, could be used some, some fleshing out in the future. I was just thinking, darn, if there were only some funders working in the space that were around to get access to that, these ideas, maybe we could do something with them. Um, and the final bit of it was to try to take these ideas and put them into a mapping of the field exercises long, along with a visualization. I'm not sure we've done as well at that, but uh, you'll be ju the judge of that. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback eventually on the cluster exercises, how they were framed, what you were asked to do, the constraints under which you, you operated and what you did with that. We won't do this right now, but we will be sending out uh, an email with, uh, with a plea for feedback on this conference with this being one of the things in that. So we would greatly appreciate your, your honest and, and open feedback on that. Uh, one of the questions is whether this would be something we would ever do again, or if it was so fatally flawed that we wanted to kill it. So here is a word cloud out of that. I guess no, no great surprises there. Here's all the words of your space. Um, let's go on to the mapping if we can. So um, many fewer things out there than the ideas you've submitted earlier. We were asking for a whole lot more detail in an impossible time frame, so no surprises there. Um, I'm very delighted to see research a little bit better represented as a, as a proportion of these than before. A lot of focus on the meso and the macro again, the micro. What's next, Justin? Sure. So this is how the clusters produced. It looks like there was a little remixing in the clusters themselves. Fine with that. How about by uh, subcategory? Is that useful? Okay, okay. Well, let's skip it quickly. Quickly, go on, go on. <laughs> Let's go. Can be implemented by impl by existing institutions. Is that right? Yeah. So we've got a, a a mix of things here. Some of them are just going to be plug and play in in among those. Uh, requires new cooperation amongst existing entities. So again, about half of them there. What's next? Uh, oh, that's, wait a minute, what was the previous one? Expanded cooperation of existing cooperations. There we go. And that's no, I'm just a little surprised by that. And then requires new organizations. Now, what's up with that? Do we really believe that all the organizations that are needed to implement these policies and make them happen already exist in the world, or is it just the focus of the people who are part of existing organizations that want to do what their existing organizations can do? It may be true, it may be true, I don't know. I was just thinking about this. I think of, you know, we were invoking Christiansen before and, and the notion of innovation and disruptive innovation and, you know, the observation that often things don't come out of existing entities, that you need other people to come in with a new idea and a new idea to hack from the outside. Very briefly, you, I, there, there wasn't an option of 
need fewer organizations. <laughs> no, there wasn't. We should have added that. Yeah. A little bit facetious, but you know, it's not to say that organizations that are around. But you know, a very common strategy is to say, here's a problem that needs solving. Here's a way to solve it, and then here's an organization that we need to create to solve it. Right? It's just a very natural sort of sequence of dialogue. Yeah. And so it's really encouraging to me that people didn't go down that dialogue because that indicates some sophistication. But I wonder, given the opportunity, if people said, well, what kind of mergers, what kind of you know, more sophisticated organizational structures could be created amongst the people here? But it just, you know, it, I don't think that was a direction. But so that's when I say maybe fewer organizations. Yeah, I, I yeah. don't mean it too. too uh, so that, that's, that's a really good point. You'll, you'll see in some of the interventions, if you go browse through them, that several of them are proposing collaborations of new of existing organizations, and it is, in a sense, a, a partial merging of these organizations. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. I don't think we'll go into the voting organizations off the island exercise in this one. What's, what's, what's next here? So uh, is it hackable? And the answer for you guys is, is you have a lot, of, a lot of inputs for tomorrow, which is, which is fantastic. I don't know if you count them up there, but you, you'll, you'll be able to go in and look at those. Um, facilitate sustainability, most of them yes. Not surprised with that, that's all good. Uh, a lot of reusability, I guess that's kind of one of the, the, the tenets of this whole field. So I don't know, we, we don't want to poke on the nose and see why they don't, but um, not a lot of focus on translation, but a few of them are out there. What's next? Um, so this one too is interesting. This harks back to our, this is the question, um, does it require legal or policy changes? And, and most of the interventions that were shaped um, avoided the policy arena. They're like, just let's go change the world with what we have and not ask for permission along the way. Um, do you think those proportions are generally consistent with the proportions of how much policy work you do versus just making it happen? Please, please. Um, just, you know, based on sitting here and listening for the past three days, that does not represent the uh, split in the conversation, the amount of time we've, we've dedicated to conversation about policy. So I think it's interesting that the intervention um, is actually saying no, whereas we keep talking about yes. That is very interesting. That's just reflective of these specific interventions. That's right. But uh, maybe this is a good sign that people are looking for tractable things that are, can, be, can be achieved without asking for permission. I just the point is, you don't make up an intervention and say, let's wait till the policy changes. I think that's how we read this question. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean the policy shouldn't change, but you know, we can get on with life and do useful yeah. things without waiting. Yeah. Great, great. Let's move on. What's next here? Uh, Facilitates feedback, a whole lot of that. That's again, that's one of the tenets, that's one of the themes here. Uh, what is this one? Promotes interoperability. So a little more no's than yeses. I'm gonna save that one for Urs. Promotes access, great. Mostly yes. Uh, promotes discovery. So these are kind of these meso transactional infrastructure inter intermediary type things. A lot of that. Uh, good to know that it's, uh, that it's promoting adoption. I, I don't know if we want to push on the nose there. <laughs> if they're not doing that, then what are they doing? Uh, engages non-traditional actors. I'm a little bit surprised by that in a sense, but Again, this is working with known entities, people that know how to get things done, perhaps. Um, a huge focus on community building. Um, I don't know if I should be surprised by that. That makes sense as well. There was mentions of a lot of collaborative work. Uh, requires public outreach. I'm a little bit surprised by that one. I thought that there would be more focus on the hearts and minds. We need to change behavior kind of things. And, um, that's actually a different question. Maybe we should go forward to that and then come back. So, so in all of these, or many of them, you need to break it out by, do you want it done tomorrow? We're gonna hack and you're not gonna, you're not gonna ask for policy for that. Uh, sure. You want it done in three years, you want it done in five years, and I think you probably see a, a different kind of pattern out there where you just be this mushed all together. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which doesn't give you a very good reading on. Sure, on, sure. So on it's the, the, the notion of outreach, is that just, 
too big that it's not a short to medium term goal to have? That the means are not well known or it, maybe it's not that important? It's also not well defined. It's not well defined. It's, it's, it's not well defined. Yeah, so, Right. Yep, yep, fair enough. This is kind of a, a crude version of that. So uh, another thing that, that struck me about the conversations of the last couple of days, which I didn't hear a whole lot about, is, is a theory of dif diffusion. And I don't know anything about this in this space, but I, I, mean, I, I, I know the theories that exist amongst um, farmers, for example, and how you get new innovations into, and get farmers to adopt them. Are there, are there similar theories of adoption in the OER space or in the education space that are useful and needed, that needed to be understood well in this space. I mean, a lot of this OER thing is putting together resources that could be reused over and over and again. We're gonna copy them and we're gonna remix them, share them around. But how, how does this happen? What's the propagation of this? And what are the key seed points? And how do we promote the propagation of these? And is this well known or is this a question that needs research? I just ask that out of naivete. I, I, I don't have something in mind, but I didn't hear. I mean, Rich said earlier that, you know, he showed the, uh, what, what is, is it jumping the chasm, straddling the chasm? I don't remember the word he, words, but is, is there a theory in this space for, for diffusion? There are lots of theories in, in yeah? space for diffusion. Uh, and it depends upon where you're trying to, what you're trying to reach. Uh, if you're trying to reach into, into the schools, you have one set of theories about it and how you do it, and it may involve policy. If you if you have a very lively uh, um, product uh, and you want to reach across the world, uh, you you can go up on on the on the web in the same way that the Khan Academy did, and and suddenly diffused all over the world. So you know there's there's a whole bunch of different different sets of strategies, and most people use a mix a mix set or try to use a mix set. You, you know, it's not, there's yeah. not one set, it's, it's not like agriculture. You right, have right. have quite as much control over it. And, uh, right, so I'm not suggesting there should be one path. So that was, that was the other thing that, I, that I've picked up in listening these days, is that the, the, the point and granularity of intervention seems to be multifaceted in this case, that, that people have a lot of different targets in this. You could, you could target individual teachers, you could target schools and say, let's get this school to adopt it, a school district, a state, a country, or a completely different slice, which is let's find some students who are gonna be insurrectionist and bring these things in the classroom or a coalition of students or, or, or get in through the informal classroom or the Trojan horse example we heard from before. So I, I guess there's a lot of diversity of of, uh, of approaches here, and it's the the theory of diffusion is going to have to vary by by the approach there. But um, I'd love to hear more about that. If that's something that needs more research, then I'd love to hear that too as an item to put on the agenda and say we need to understand how to do this. Or are we going to take a a, a, a Coney 20, 2012 approach to this thing, or are we gonna go to the states and have them seed the work in this area, or how's this gonna happen? So, an open question. Do you have a microphone? I, I think that was one of the issues uh, in comparing the, the movement forward between this and the publishers, because having an innovation that you want to share broadly is very difficult without a transmission and the publishers have created that very effectively, and it is at the, somewhat at the state level and then at the district level, yep. and then it goes down through top-down mandates. So that's one system of transmission that's been very effective. It's very difficult, except through, as Mike said, that something catches fire, like mm -hmm. the Khan Academy, and then spreads yep. quickly that is the exception in this space, right? Absolutely Kanaka, yeah. the exception. Yeah. Most people don't find out about what's out there, which is why I think probably uh, creating the community, creating the, the building of the community is so critical because most people don't even, I was talking to one person who was here who said, I didn't even know what OER was before I, OER was before I got the invitation. I had to huh. look it up. Interesting. So I, I yeah. think that there's a lot of, of work to do yeah. in this arena. 
yeah, yeah. So I just want to restate what you're saying in different words, which is to say that the, the choices are to try to work with and co-opt existing institutions and distribution. Is that your point? Yeah. I'll let you make it, please. Well, um, I'm not sure that that's yeah. going to be my point. My point is that I think we need to stop thinking about diffusion and think more about what we're actively doing to promote the resources we're creating. I think there tends well, to tell be... Me the, tell me the difference. Um, so building materials and putting them out there is not enough to secure adoption. It happens from time to time. Khan yeah. Academy is a great example, but it's not dependable. Yeah. If we as a movement want our resources to actually catch on and get used, we need to get out there and promote them. And I think, um, actually, a, a, an excellent point. It's something that what, that's what the publishing industry does. Yeah. That's the way the system is set up right now. Faculty, teachers, state boards, they hear about textbooks from the publishers. Yeah. So if we're going to compete with the traditional model, we need to fight fire with fire. So you need a marketing firm. Well, uh, actually, <laughs> my organization has been funded by the Hewlett Foundation to organize students as a marketing yeah. force. For awesome. Them. So it already exists. Yeah. Well, when I, uh, <laughs> when, I, when I mean diffusion, by, by the way, I mean the more useful version, which is people are actually using the resources, not just throwing them out there. Did you want to pile on? Please turn your... I would suggest that um, we don't actually want to go fight fire with fire or go head on with existing models. I think we have the opportunity to create a pull system as opposed to a push system. And, to, and that, I think, will also help to transform the usefulness of our resources, because we should be responding to the demands for learning resources that are out there, yep. existing gaps. And then we can create a, uh, an infrastructure or a system whereby teachers, students, et cetera, can request a specific resource, and we supply it. That way, we're not creating a resource and then attempting to push it on people. We are creating resources that respond to the needs that people have. So it still gets us back to the question of, so what is it that spreads pull, whatever that is, and who's pulling? Is it students? Is it teachers? Is it schools? Is it district? Is it states? Who's doing the polling and why? Which leads me to my other question. If you have, if you have an answer for that, I'm glad to hear it. Well, I would say all of the above, and specifically, um, the reason there would be pull is because there's there's demands that are not being met. There's gaps in um, either the the uh, the ability to serve specific learners, uh, the ability to to cover new subjects, the um, lack of time to prepare curriculum. I mean, we should be looking at this from a user user-centric perspective, and yep. the users are all of the above. It's the all of them are experiencing issues with education. There's a crisis in education. There's an economic crisis. There's a, um, an engagement crisis. There's all, all of these things are happening. So we should structure it such that we address those particular needs. Yeah. Do you want to respond to that, please? For, if I may. Yep. Um, so I think that, that that's the point, though, that we need OER out there as a solution. but. So we need to let them know that OER is a solution and that we have the capability to create these resources for them so that it is still going to take some action. And I objected to the word diffusion because it is a very passive word. I think we need to think more about active words like promotion or um, marketing or whatever. Yeah, but diffusion can happen through a lot of different mechanisms. And certainly people do need to know about them. They not only need to know about them, they have to want them when they see them. So yeah. Please. My question is just what's already been stated, but there's many segments to the education market, and there's typically not one um, competitor to the whole OER space. So when Nicole talks, she's particularly talking about the textbook space, and there is an existing structure that some try we're trying to uh, create room, have wedge, top, whatever the word might be. And we need to have different mechanisms, I think, to tackle that vis-a-vis -vis some of the pull issues that Utah's talking about. So I think one of the issues for OER is that there is a, we're from cradle to grave. We're from the very beginning until a lifelong learner inside schools, outside schools, and we're trying to figure out what mechanisms at this point in time will be most effective. And I think we have to disaggregate the grain size of the market 
a little bit to Mike's point about the data, it's hard to read the data because we're representing a certain group, but to the extent that we can be much more finely tuned as we think about each aspect that each of these group, each of our groups here is trying to tackle, then I think our, whether we're a campaign or we're going for diffusion or what our tactic is or policy, <coughs> excuse me, whatever the lever is, there's gonna be different levels and different strategies because if you think about in some ways the competitor or the gap, there's a reason that exists and we have to tackle that head on. Yep, yep. U useful addition, thank you. I was gonna Please. say, um, we teachers don't care where the resources come from whether it's OER or publishers. I mean, we care in the sense as if we're out looking for resources and it's free, that's obviously um, a better um, option in, in the, the budgets and the poor schools that uh, we're funding. But one thing, I, I one observation I've had this week is uh, the OER community is much more nimble though, and then it can adapt and change where I think the traditional you know, publishing world is, is not as, as nimble and can change with the needs that, that uh, are changing so rapidly. So I think you guys have got a lot to offer us teachers. Um, yeah, you do, but we, we still don't, we, we just want good materials to put in front of our kids that engage our students in real learning. Yep, wonderful, wonderful. So I just wanna, please, please, go for it. Just a quick comment. People talk about diff diffusion and, and broadcasting and, and outreach and promotion, but we don't talk that much about the gap, the difference between a movement for the community and yeah. PR for things that people are doing. And yep. I think if we're going to build a movement, if we're going to recognize the amazing community that, that is the current OER community, or maybe the bigger community that doesn't know that, that term, but is, yeah. doing our, is, is doing God's work, then uh, to, use, uh, to use movement language, that's, that's a different approach, and that requires a different kind of, of focus. Yep, yep, very, very useful point. So, so one thing I just want to throw out there and I don't want to talk about because I'm going to run out of time and I, it's, I need to turn it over to my boss at some point and if I don't, I'll be in trouble. So the incentives are all, all in the right, right direction here. But um, one of the questions I think that needs more pokey and I, I heard Barbara talk about the need for more research is uh, it would be really nice to know in more detail to what extent people and teachers and schools are unaware of the resources, are aware of them and don't adopt them and what the other ob obstacles to adoption are. And I think with, without that information, I think may, many of you may have a, a better vision of that than I do or, or an intuitive feel for that. But I think that more information in that realm uh, would only be good and, and, and help to target uh, the various interventions that, that are out there. I'd like to just draw in a couple more of the specific examples. I apologize that where there's so little time and so many good ideas that could be discussed, but I wondered if, if the, uh, the stories people would like to give us a, a quick kind of one minute summary of what they were talking about. Somebody want to do that? Please, yes, yes. Exactly, with the OER in the middle, yeah. Push your button so we can hear you, thank you. Hello. So uh, I guess I'm the last one standing for our group. So essentially, from the story's perspective, we basically, um, for, one, one, for one thing, trying to capture the stories of people using the OER tools, be it from the content or be it from whatever the software people are producing, being able to capture that, but not even kind of going a step further, kind of just capturing those narratives, either video or just through comments from theirs. But then what would be interesting would be to allow them to, um, to post it somewhere so we can get feedback kind of have that iterative process of them giving us feedback so we could improve our content or our products, whatever we're producing for them from the OER side. Yeah. And then uh, uh, ultimately allow them to voice the, the students or the teachers or the developers or whatnot who are doing it. Um, then at the end, what would be interesting is that when they do share their story, uh, they'd be able to embed and ask what they would like in order to kind of improve the product. It'd be really great if you had this or you did this. And then it, in some way, kind of Kickstarter-esque, but not by money-wise, they could move up the channels that people were liking or giving a thumbs up, and then uh, basically yeah. put on a roadmap. So something like that, and it kind of right. creates a system. Right, which is, which is related to SJ's kind of movement building idea. I, I like that yeah. idea as one of the, kind of the, uh, the constellation of the great ideas that were put out there as it weaving together the, 
personalization of learning and the feedback as well as, as the narrative element and the human voice. You could, uh, you could see that as, as having an impact out there. Um, a lot of great things. There was, uh, there was mechanisms for developing trust. I think that's one that would resonate with everyone here. Um, there was a, a couple research-related projects, which I found very, very interesting. One was uh, using SMS in, in rural India to evaluate uh, professional and developmental training, which I thought was a, a, a wonderful kind of pilot program. They put the level of risk on that one as very high, but I think the space needs more high risk projects. Um, there was the open virtual labs in US high schools, which is a very ambitious to get every school to adopt a, a, a virtual lab. And the point being that they already exist out there. The infrastructure is in place. Uh, we just need to spread it. We need diffusion, as it were, of that. Um, an interesting proposal put out on uh, studying the retention of students in community colleges, which is a problem, and seeing if the use of OER resources helped with retaining students in, uh, in community colleges. Very interesting idea. There are many more. I highly recommend you go poke around on there and read the things there, please. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm from, uh, uh, what was it, uh, clandestine uh, group K. All right, all right. Um, and I think we, we had two, uh, two ideas that, that could easily be uh, projects for the hack day. One of them is the, uh, the documenting uh, open education resources and related concepts on Wikipedia. So specifically uh, for like a one day project, uh, getting a sense of what articles should be the highest priorities, I think would be the, the, the main thing, but also doing some work on Wikipedia articles. Um, but the, the other one, which uh, Vicki Davis came up with, and I think she's, she's gone by now, uh, which really resonated strongly in the group, was the idea of a, um, I'm forgetting the, the name that we came up with, but it was, it was basically 2013 year of OER for, uh, for K to 12. Um, and the idea was to have, for every week, you have an open ed educational resource, and you blog about how that is the OER of the week and you make a, a, a video and a presentation about how that resource might be used in a K-12 classroom, and you have like a badging system where uh, educators can get recognition for having incorporated you know, 10 of these throughout the year or 20 of them throughout the year, um, and you develop a community of people around a specific open educational resource so they can compare notes on what was effective, things like that. Great, thank you. So I wanna pause this conversation. I don't wanna close this conversation. There's a lot of great ideas out there and I think they would benefit from the feedback of others in the group. So please do go have a look at it. I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you for playing along with this exercise. I hope that uh, you saw that you were all guinea pigs and this was a very experimental process and I really appreciate your, your patience and persistence and, and following through on that with us. Um, I will turn it over to you, Urs, if you're ready. And I'm sorry for eating up so much time. No, that's, that's great. Actually, I, if, if you agree, I th it would be nice to hear maybe two or three more proposals before we then turn uh, to, to Vic. Uh, Certainly. I think that's really inspiring. I just want to add, of course, we will, we will um, uh, once we have gone through the, the cleanup of the data, we will make everything available back to you, to the community, and certainly also share uh, the ideas and, and for interventions with, with the Hewlett team. Uh, so this is, of course, this session very much a starting point um, and not the end point, as, as Rob just said. And we totally understand the, that we want to get more out of the conference in terms of concrete suggestions. Uh, the cluster meetings of obviously have been one vehicle, uh, but it's just not possible, of course, to aggregate all the data within the one hour we had between collecting the feedback and, and this concluding session. So there's more to come, uh, but probably we can get three or so more uh, insights from uh, intervention ideas that we haven't already heard about. So back to you in that sense. Thanks. Let me hear what you had to say, though. Does, it, does anybody else want to throw out their project idea? and? and Please, please. Uh, group B, uh, I think there are a few of us left. Actually, Lisa, we took your idea and ran with it, even though you weren't there to help us write it up. Uh, one of the things we noticed was that um, 
Yeah. It was a good one. Uh, <laughs> while all of us have our own projects and to some degree are doing great work and all advancing the same movement, there's less collaboration among uh, various organizations than one might expect. And perhaps it's because we're, although all working towards a you know, public good, there is still some competition for scarce resources and funding and things like that. But one of our asks was to encourage foundations like Hewlett and others to make a distinction to, uh, pub, uh, to fund rather projects that are collaborative among other organizations to really foster that cross-pollination because we come together once a year basically and hear all the great work others are doing, I, I think there could be a, a slightly more deliberate um, approach to, to funding people to work together. And perhaps, Lisa, would you mind elaborating because it was your idea to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought that was a fine rendering of that. It, 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 it occurred to me that the, the infrastructure and players in this space you might think of the moving forward as taking the hourglass shape of the internet as, as if Jonathan were here, he would describe it well to you, but the notion that you have many different sources and types of impacts of, of inputs into a system, but at, at some level you need a certain level of interoperability to, uh, to allow the shareability, the redistribution of things, but then you have many ways that it could spin out into the world and many forks there. And the, one of the questions is, what are the points of redundancy that are healthy? And what are the points of investing in collaboration? Collaboration is never cheap, it's never easy, but often it's worth it. And uh, how to do that? It also harks back to the, you know, is it a Wikipedia or is it 100 Wikipedia questions before? So leveraging off of that same idea of collaboration, um, one of the ideas that our group worked on was there's been a lot of discussion in all the sessions about um, professional learning for teachers and whether it's about OER or more innovative pedagogy or all these areas. And so a, just a very short term thing that we are, we are going to be launching the first phase of in June is a collaboration using the peer-to-peer -peer university um, school of ed um, to put together some professional learning groups for teachers around um, different different topics, and the one we specifically have, have planned is with NROC um, around developmental English, which will also bring in um, OER. And I just, on behalf of the P2PU School of Ed, I would like to extend an invitation to anybody who would like to do a learning group um, around any topic you would like. I would be very happy to have people. We're gonna do, we've done, we're on our third sort of launch of, of groups or courses, which will be in June, although we're happy to do stuff off cycle as well. And I think it's a really nice, it's, it's, it's a good collaboration tool for our community as well as modeling collaborative, more innovative approaches for teachers. And I think it also can be um, really low cost and low time and kind of a way to sort of dip our toes into some things and especially P2PU as a sort of laboratory environment to try different things, and I would, I would love to see just everyone here try something, share ideas about what works and what doesn't, and use it as a, as a platform to launch your stuff and get the word out more. Yeah, please. Hi, Ruth Rominger from Mighty um, NROC. Uh, to build on this idea, um, in our network of, of uh, educational institutions, we hear a lot for the need of a new kind of professional development. And I know many of you have different needs and capacities in creating professional development for particular topics around OER and 21st century learning. And so we thought that maybe a low bar would be to use the P2P University platform to, and the School of Education to actually host some of these early collabor collaborations on developing and sharing professional development uh, resources and see if we can build up um, in the community some good resources and uh, collaborative efforts. Yep, wonderful, thank you, thank you. What else, what else? Any other interventions we want to throw out there and discuss? Anything that really needs to be said before we move on? 
Go ahead. It's sort of, in some ways, a very simple idea that we came up with yesterday and then everybody was gone, so I wrote it up today. Um, but it follows off on the policy discussion also. There's not really an OER.org kind of site where if you tell someone about OER and they try to figure out, they can kind of figure out what it is, but they can't really figure out exactly how to just deploy it in their context. If, if they're you know, the education minister for some country or if they're superintendent of a district, they have to go and hopefully find one of the people in this room and call them up and say, okay, so what do I actually do with this? Yep. And we talked about creating essentially lists of just frequently asked questions like, if I'm in this position, what do I do? How do I get this deployed? And obviously we have to figure out the answers to those questions. But I think to the degree that we can do that, just putting up a really spiffy website that says, I am an ex student, teacher, administrator, et cetera, and here are the questions that I might want to answer to actually use this would really help adoption. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So a more centralized node in the network, please. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how to express this, but I've been listening carefully over the last couple of days. And I mean, one of the things that seems to me to be abundantly clear is that increasingly the issue of content access is a non-issue as long as people have an internet connection, which is problematic in, in certain parts of the world, but, but it, decreasingly so. Um, the thing that's concerned me uh, as I've listened over the last couple of days is the extent to which we seem to be drifting into a, a kind of focus on systems level change. And that's not to ignore all the important changes happening at the micro and meso level that is focused on what we think the system's capable of tolerating instead of the ways in which we think the system needs to change. And, and I think that this movement is at a, at a point at which it's going to go one of two directions. It's either going to get absorbed into the system in a way in which its effect is blunted and the system will largely be able to carry on operating as it has done from a teaching and learning perspective over the last couple of hundred years without any fundamental changes. Or alternatively, we're going to try and confront the system with the requirement for a real serious pedagogical transformation. Uh, and what's concerned me over the last couple of days is the extent to which I think we're drifting in the wrong direction because we're focusing so much on what we call low hanging fruits or easy quick wins and these kinds of things that I think that actually what we're starting to do is certainly introduce some cheaper business models around textbook production, say, or help people at a micro level think about how they right, might remanage their classroom in more effective ways. But we're not actually any more challenging some of the fundamental assumptions on which the system is based, particularly pedagogically. What is the curriculum that we consider to be important to be teaching and assessing, and what that means for how we actually use content in teaching and learning environments? And secondly, how we manage and organize the human resources and physical resources we have at our disposal because predominantly we're still assuming that we organize them according to classrooms. But there's actually no real logic to that anymore when you have such predominant access to digital content. You want to reorganize the way you use your physical and human resources in much more efficient ways. <coughs> so I suppose the challenge I'm putting to the OER community at this point is, is, is do we allow ourselves to be increasingly co-opted into the system so that OER becomes a, a subset of a feature of how the system operates currently or are we now, with the wonderful achievements that have been made so far and the great innovations that are out there on the margins, are we actually going to stand up and start challenging the way in which that system runs on a more fundamental level? Or you know, are we just going to say, well, that's too big and the system's changed too slowly, therefore we'll just step back from it? And I'm really worried at this stage that I've heard too much of a willingness to step back at this point just when we're at the moment when we could actually challenge it properly. Well, that's quite a provocation for 455 on the last day. <laughs> I just thought you don't want people to leave feeling too comfortable. <laughs> we were just so close to resolving all the issues, too, and you, can, you threw that out there. Does anybody want to respond to that? How, how do folks feel about that? Please. So it's been, hello. So, uh, Essentially for BIE, so my name is Albert Solis. I work for the Buck Institute for Education, and, and we try to do everything and anything for PBL, for project-based learning. So that's one of the things when we go into places and people are trying to adopt within PBL. Now, kind of as I understand more about the OER space and trying to also say how to bring OER pieces within that, so you kind of have a, a two thing, uh, a, uh, kind of like a two-step thing that we have to kind of adopt and look at OER pieces and also think about adopting, potentially doing PBL in their schools and their classrooms. So that's something that we're going to try to see as you kind of roll this out and we have the grant group picking on them to see, kind of also incorporating the OER pieces and seeing if they could also do project-based learning 
throughout that entire context also. So trying to give the context of how all these things kind of work together. So that's something that we hope to try to do uh, during the pilot. So if you're interested in learning more and want to be part of that, if you're talking with a lot of people and trying to see how everybody fits, kind of it's really, really uh, interesting uh, how that all can kind of work out. So please uh, be more than happy to, to hear if anything yep. someone has to say. So, and I have PBL stickers too. So uh, <laughs> these, are, these are great. You can have OER stickers if you want. I can make those too. All right, all right. So I'm going to respond to your question, and I'm going to turn it over to Vic after that. So um, part of me says, yay, let's take it on. We need to change. There's fundamental changes that will do real measurable good in the world, and we shouldn't ignore those opportunities, and there should be a call to action. And part of me is going to channel Justin and say, um, we have a deep problem on our hands if OER is successful as we think it might be and it allows very talented people from talented, educated families to opt out of an ossified system and leaves the rest of the population living in these abandoned um, institutions. So there's, there's difficult questions to be grappled with there and, and bigger than today. You want to respond to that. You couldn't let, you couldn't let it go, huh? these stratified systems and these powerful stakeholder groups that tend to drag us into the you know status quo of structure. <laughs> well, well, I can say, well, or as powerful anyway, um, one of the projects that we're working on is, is teaching youth uh, uh, skills through business process outsourcing. Having youth actually engage in real life employment and doing real life work and getting paid for it and learning in the process. I, I just, I have found personally that there can be a bit more latitude in experimenting with new ways of educating in the developing world than in the developed world. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so there's obviously so much to talk about, and I wish we had two more days, but we're, we're going to have to call it a close at some point. So thank you very much for your participation in this session. And for the final words, I want to turn it over to you, Vic. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for a phenomenal three days. Um, I think the first thing I would like to do is express great thanks to the Berkman Center for an amazing, amazing job. I think when we approached them last year, uh, it was after the conference last year that ISK me through, which was an amazing conference in itself. And uh, I think they knew they had some big shoes to fill. Um, I think it's quite resounding that they did a phenomenal job. One of the things that I think really stood out and that hit me was three days ago when I stood out to do the opening remarks, I looked in the audience and quickly realized I actually didn't recognize about a third of the people. And I realized, oh, I better introduce myself. Um, and I think that's part of what Berkman was really strong at. They really brought the Berkman community, the open access community, supported some of our quality education program members, and really brought a lot of, I think this is probably just about the highest percentage of non pure grantees at the meeting, and I think it really helped inform our conversation, push our thinking, bring diverse feedback, and it helped grow the community. So, you know, that was a real gift and something that I think was exceptional. I really appreciate it. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, especially just want to call out Urs Gosser, Caroline Nolan, Amar Asher, Colin McClay, and Corey, how do you pronounce the Uriyama, Uriyama. So thank you so much, and we have, we have some gifts for you. Um, yeah, we have some gifts, which we'll hand out. Um, I also actually want to thank one of my colleagues. Uh, I actually uh, had to step out a lot this year on some family leave, and uh, I know this is a huge lift. And Kathy really took this on and deserves a lot of the credit from the Hewlett side for really working to help frame this up, working with Berkman and managing this whole process. So I just wanted to recognize her and say thank you. <laughs> um, so I did want to put out a few thoughts in the open spirit that have been kind of floating through my head over the past few days um, and some food for thought uh, over the next year. Um, I'm going to borrow a little bit from uh, some of my training in design thinking, actually. 
Um, for those of you that don't know, design thinking is a problem solving methodology that's developed by designers to support innovation. Um, it's used in design schools around the world um, and is a very kind of generative and creative process. One of the concepts they have in design thinking is they talk about sometimes you really want to flare and sometimes you want to focus. And I think, you know, we do this kind of inherently here and there, but I find it as a powerful thought process to really be intentional about that and to think through strategically. Do we really want to flare or do I really want to focus? And whether it's a project or a strategy and where do we need flaring, where do we need focus, what are the conditions and how do you think about that? And I think it, it's very applicable to OER um, and it's also challenging in OER. Uh, it's a complex ecosystem, it's a large scope, there's a lot of things going on. Um, and OER is inherently actually flaring because it's open and it's extremely generative. And so what it means is that we often get into these things and we end up doing a lot of things. <laughs> and it's, we tend to do a lot of things for a lot of people. OER can be, um, there's nothing stopping it from being used and having impact anywhere, really. So what it also means is that it can be challenging to focus because you may pick something to focus on but then find out other people are doing other things with what you're doing and there's other opportunities all the time and then you start to kind of lose focus or it's hard to maintain and drive to fully completion. So just, you know, a few examples, you know, sometimes uh, something is very early in its maturity or process and you want a lot of flair out there and even OER as a whole in general I think is still in kind of this everyone's learning a lot, we don't know the answers and so we have to be very generative. But we're also at the level where we're starting to make large scale systems impact. And in order to build sort of an infrastructure to do that, you really need to have focal points, very specific, clear things, whether it's products that can be kind of flashpoints and really support large scale integration, whether it's research that clearly takes on a point and that other people can build on, well, it's, whether it's a policy that's passed. Some, you know, sometimes a, a focal point can be, we get this policy passed, well, you know what? Then suddenly there's a hundred other policies that can build off that. And so you have to have these focal points out there for other people to really build off of. Because if you have constant flair, you have kind of generative stuff, but it, it's hard to really take it to the next level. Um, so I think, uh, I think it's something I think that's useful just to go through in the context of your project, your organization, the field, your position in the field, and think about, uh, go through the exercise of thinking, well, is this something that we want to be very generative? And it may be. Um, or is this something where we think we can drive to a very specific point, make a clear impact? And either one that, that you're doing, I think the most important thing is then you think about um, how do I communicate that out to the field so that other people can build on it? And so how do I represent you know, is this a research study that we're putting out there? Does it plug into the, you know, evidence hub and these other areas in the community to really allow other people to build on this? Or is this, you know, a ton of ideas and I want to involve the whole community in kind of throwing this out there and seeing kind of where we start getting some traction. And then we'll focus after that. Um, but kind of thinking through some of that I think is important. And then a big thing that can help, I think, and help people focus is actually a strong dovetail with learning theory. And I think it's one of the challenges that the whole education system has. And that is one thing that, that we all know, but I think we're fairly unsophisticated in how we deal with it, is that context means everything in learning. And we're not very rigorous about tracking, understanding, communicating uh, about context and understanding even what are, the, what are the parameters of the context that are important or not in various and whatever you're trying to do. And so one of the easiest ways to focus when you're doing something very generative is pick a very specific context and drive to that and get to the point of where you have that inflection point or catalytic moment, whether it's a, you know, a product, or a process, a research report, or anything. And, um, and, and I think that that's part of the exercise because often when we get into conversations about trying to focus, well, there's a million different ways that we can go. And we want to do so many of them. Um, but without that kind of discipline and rigor, uh, it's really hard to get it to where you're at a focal point that truly has that catalytic impact to grow on. Um, and I think education as a whole, you see this time and time again, where yes, someone 
kind of prove something in a context, and then all of a sudden big foundations jump in, policymakers jump in, gets funded, it scales, and you know what? Then the efficacy dissipates, and it disappears, and everyone's disappointed, and we didn't get the transformation we want. And so we have to get sophisticated about understanding contexts, about seeing what's relevant across them, and, uh, and building the body of knowledge and sophistication of tracking impact in various contexts. So those are just some of the thoughts. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and uh, I think the last piece is we get to announce um, where next year is. Oh yeah, and let me mention, I have to plug the Open Ed Conference, Vancouver in October. Uh, we'd love to see you there. That's gonna be another great event. And uh, okay, month left. Cool. And next year, we will step down from the halls of Harvard and uh, we will walk to an amazing place that I think will be truly inspirational. It will ground us in practice and impact um, in new ways that we haven't been before. We're very excited and it also has some of the best weather in the world. Uh, we'll be in sunny San Diego at High Tech High. We'll be hosting the conference. And uh, I think it'll be great to dive into. It's one of the best premier global primary secondary education schools impact on exactly the groups that, that need the most help and just phenomenal. And they're blending into even post-secondary is quite powerful. So it's a really inspiring place. We're very excited. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. So thank you all so much for a phenomenal three days. Amazing ideas, amazing passion to where we had to draw the line and say, OK, we, we got we to gotta have time for drinks. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon. Thank you.